By the grace of Christ, my brethren, let us read from the Gospel according to Luke. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 21 and verse 5. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verse 5. Luke 21, 5. By the grace of our Lord. Then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, These things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. For these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be a great earthquake in places, and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth in wisdom, which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience possess your souls. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in its midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things may be writ that are written may be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nourishing babes in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles into the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in the sun, in, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this world, of this life, and that they come on you unexpectedly. For it shall come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. Amen. When the disciples stood and admired this temple, that was adorned with beautiful stones and many donations, then our Lord Jesus Christ took the chance to declare the truth. He told them, Do not admire the beauty of the life upon this earth. 
no matter how beautiful and adorned it is and glorious and great it may seem do not let your heart free in, the, in taking anything it desires and he said this to the disciples my brethren and it is very important for the Word of God to be spoken to hearts that are ready to hear hearts that are prepared from God himself so that they may accept the Word of God as a Word of God that it is and he says do not admire do not be ecstatic about these great things that you see in the world elsewhere our Lord Jesus Christ said that anything that is great in this world is an abomination before God and why is it an abomination why does it provoke God's disgust because abomination means that God abhors it he is disgusted by it why do the great things of this world provoke this sense of disgust and in, in God's heart because the great things draw people into perdition for example it's the Babylon with the many lights many colors the great marvelous things that you see in this world which with which the devil by speaking to people through these things he draws them and he tries to deceive if it be possible even the elect even the chosen ones God doesn't like it when we admire shakable things and God doesn't like it for our own benefit not for himself but for our own benefit because when you admire the things that are shakable when your heart turns toward the things that are shakable then it departs from that which we must admire and worship and seek in our life and that is the unshakable things so in this adoration my dear brethren we have to be careful of something God can bless you materially but he also blesses you spiritually but we have to differentiate God's intention and God's activities the Apostle Paul says blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in every blessing the spiritual in the heavenly places so by God there is that which our Lord Jesus Christ says in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and there is also let me say this also and every blessing material here on the earth so this means that God is able because the world and everything that is in it belongs to the Lord he is able to bless men in any way but God's commandment is let it be enough for you let it be sufficient to you anything that you have and we'll see what this means it says be satisfied with the food and the coverings that you have be content because godliness with self-content is great wealth that is a great wealth for man and it is he is referring to the heart of man with this what do you think is wealth and glory in your life if you believe your wealth to be the wealth and the glory of your life to be the things that are shakable then these shakable things in the eyes of God are an abomination because they draw they take your attention away from the heavenly things down to the earthly things but if you believe if you have the strong opinion that the shakable things that God gives you and has given you and has given you are only for the glory of God they are not yours you have not gained them on your own God has given them to you so that God may be glorified through them and the most important as the Bible says the abundance of one to cover the lack of the other so that there may be equality because God wants people to be equal in the church it can't be that someone has abundance and wealth and someone is in poverty in the church and it's not for us to sit down and make a system that is, imitated, that is like the socialist or the communist uh, laws no it's an issue of faith and godliness it is great wealth for you to be godly with self-content because the Christian is content either if he has few or a lot or if he has very much or nothing 
he is content. He praises God because he knows that whatever happens in his life, God knows about it. And he hopes that God will bless him, where? In every blessing that is spiritual in the heavenly places. Because this is our purpose. This is our goal. The Word of God says, If you believe that Christ is for the earthly things, then you are worse than the unbelievers. May God keep us. Christ isn't for the earthly things. And the proof of this is that when He Himself came, He didn't have anywhere to lay His head. Of course, this does not mean that man doesn't take care of his household. That he doesn't have good management of, his, of the things that God has given him so he can prosper. But we all must know, my beloved brethren, that God is the one who searches out hearts and kidneys. Only God. And what does this mean? He searches out your will and your ability, the, what you can do. Now what I can do and what I want, you do not know. Only the Lord knows. Only the Lord knows what I can do and what I desire. And from this, God comes and, and, and upon these two things, God comes and negotiates His relationship with us. And for that reason, even when it comes to alms, God says two things. First of all, whatever comes out of your heart, your desire that is, and the second is whatever you are able, whatever you are able to give. Because it is considered that it is God's favor that you have some money to give. So we have to be very careful and protect with all diligence our heart. We have to protect it with all diligence because our tomorrow, and especially in these evil days that are, we are living, our tomorrow does not belong to us. Tomorrow belongs in the hands of Christ. And the Bible says, Wealthy people have become poor and have fallen into hunger, but those who seek the Lord, they will grow. Those who seek the Lord shall be blessed. And the man who approaches God must know that God is and becomes a rewarder to those who seek Him. And all the young people and the chosen young people will dis be discouraged, but those who seek the Lord, those who wait on the Lord, shall renew their strength like the eagle. So what is the crucial point? It is for us to seek. What is our ambition? What is our life? What are our plans? What is the crucial part, point? It's for us to seek, to seek the Lord. That is what we will seek, God, with all our heart. And so that we may make it specific, because for us to seek God, we can all say easily, I will seek Him, I seek Him with my life. But so we can make it more specific. We will have to seek, first of all, the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And none of all the rest knowing that all the rest will be added unto us. He doesn't permit under no condition to man to seek the shakable things. It is not excused. It's not seen anywhere in the gospel. On the contrary, our daily bread give us this day, Christ teaches us to pray. Nowhere in the gospel will you see the Word of God encouraging the people of God to seek shakeable things. The shakeable things, we consider them granted. We are content with what we have. God, whatever He gives us has been, is a blessing from above. We thank Him and we praise Him for everything that we have. And especially we plead with Him that we be good managers. Because the one who has entrusted the stewardship can take it away. Very easily and very suddenly he may do this so my beloved brethren he who seeks the Lord is the one who has dedicated his life to Christ that is he has trusted his life to Christ and he knows what does he know with all certainty that whatever we see will be destroyed not a stone upon a stone will be left 
which will not be destroyed. And he said this back then for the disciples who were looking at the temple, and he was prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple. But the word of God is contemporary always, and he speaks to us today, that whatever you see now and admire today, and Anna lately is admiring Google Earth. She's admiring the earth. And the Lord comes and tells me, the things that she is admiring, none of them will be left. And I told her, it's good that you're admiring this. It's good. Praise be to God. And she added, yeah, always, what, 50 years now, 60 years, I don't know how many years we are, how old we are. She said, I want us to travel. I've been wanting us to travel. And in the beginning, we couldn't, we couldn't. But when we believed, I don't know what happened, but I completely lost my interest in traveling. They were giving me uh, trips to Europe, and I couldn't go. I had the church to take care of. It was the word of God. There were all these things that I had considered, and I just couldn't travel. And my wife lacked this. And suddenly, she found Google Earth on the Internet. It's a, it's a software where you can go in there, and you can look at uh, all of the Earth. You can see the, the houses, zoom into houses. And that way, she can look at the whole world. And then the Lord told me, and I'm telling to all of you, that all these things will be destroyed in the end. The heavens and the earth will pass away. And I'm saying this with fear of God in my heart. The heavens and the earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Do not admire anything that is shakable. God is not pleased in it. Let us not be pleased... Let our heart not be pleased in shakable things. And especially in the wealth. And wealth isn't only money, especially money, but it's also knowledge, education. It's that thing that provokes arrogance in the soul of man. Terrible arrogance. I am. I have this. I've done that. And Paul and all the men of God say, it's not I but the grace of Christ that dwells within me. Because this is the truth. And always, my brethren, whatever God gives us, let us be grateful for it. Let us praise God for it. And everything else, our mind, gifts, God has not given these things for us. Everything that He's given us, every gift, spiritual and material, is for the edification of the people of God, for the edification of other people. He did not give you prophecy so you can prophesy to yourself. He gave you prophecy so you can edify, encourage, and comfort your brethren. He did not give you the word of wisdom and knowledge so that you may be proud and say that you are a great preacher and everyone else admires you. You'll lose it the next day. He gave it to you so you can share the messages of the gospel. And even more, the Apostle Paul says something that I always liked, and now I like it even more, because I understood it lately. I re understood it better. He said, to me, the least of all the saints was given grace, this grace, to evangelize among the nations the unsearchable wealth of Christ. I have been given, he says, this blessed grace, to speak, to evangelize, to explain the unsearchable wealth. How can you compare it to the stones and to, to the great things, to the donations, to the palaces, to the industries, to the ships? Compare now this unsearchable wealth of Jesus Christ to these things. The Apostle Paul says, this is the grace of God for me. And with acknowledgement, he says, I am the least of the brethren and the apostles. And truly the Apostle Paul was the first to whom God entrusted this grace who preached the gospel to the Gentiles. But since then, He has given this grace to all of us, to all of you. We have all been bestowed this grace to know the unsearchable treasure of Jesus Christ. And to speak about it. What is the unsearchable wealth of Christ? My beloved brethren, one word. But one word that we have understood within our soul. God became man so that he may take me who is wretched and vile and make me God. Like Christ. 
so that I may reign in the heavenly kingdom an everlasting life. Hallelujah. For that reason, our Lord Jesus Christ says, don't look at these things. Don't admire these things. Let your heart not be stuck to these things. All these things will pass away. Not a stone upon a stone will be left. Everything will be destroyed. And I repeat that back then he mentioned this especially for Jerusalem and the temple, that beautiful temple. But today it's for everything. And he says, be careful. The end of all is at hand, the Bible says. And when he says of all, it doesn't say of all men only. But of everything. Everything is coming to an end. Whatever has a beginning will end. Only the word of God will remain forever. And when the disciples heard these things, as weak people that they were, small and insignificant that they were, they expressed their question, their query. They said, when Lord, when will all these things happen? What is the sign of the destruction of this place? And my beloved brethren, our Lord, in the three Gospels, Mar Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these three Gospels, that are referring to the Gentiles in general, in any way, not to the church. Matthew is, is directed toward the Hebrews, Mark is toward the Romans, and Luke was toward the Greeks and toward all people, let's say. He describes with detail the signs and also the events that will take place in the end. But in the Gospel of John that is speaking to the Church of Christ, he mentions nothing concerning the end times because the Church of Christ in one moment, in the twinkle of an eye, will leave, will just fly away. And even more, the Bible says, the things that we read before, Keep watch therefore, and every time, so that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand holy blessed before the Son of Man the judgment seat of Christ so that you may be rewarded everyone according to the work that you have done and more correctly and with more detail according to the labor of the work that he worked how much did you labor May God keep us, my beloved brethren, but because He says so, and because we have been counted worthy to know the unsearchable treasure of Christ, but also the secret, the plan that God had pre uh, prepared before the foundation of the world for humanity, we as well, with great attention, will observe the things that are to take place, and for which we pray, watch, and keep, and keep praying, so that we may be counted worthy to escape. And he uses the word escape, because we will escape with a rapture, which rapture is a word that means literally in violence, with, with speed, and by force, I, I grab something and take it. That's what Christ will do at some moment, by force, because others will not want but with great speed at, all, at the same time, he will come to snatch up his bride, raise her, raise her up so that he, she may be eternally with him. Now let us see the latter days that, as the Apostle Paul says to the Hebrews, that God, after he spoke in the past toward us, through the fathers and the prophets, many times and, with, and in many ways, in these latter days he has spoken to us through his Son through Jesus Christ, whom He has made as an heir of all, and through which He has created the ages, and who is the abundance of the glory of God, the character of the hypostasis of God. And, and be careful, God is, doesn't have three hypostases, because hypostases are existences. He's not three existences. He is one existence with three different revelations and faces. He's the triune God. He is the character of the hypostasis of God, and he holds everything with the word of his power. So if at this moment there is in nature, in humanity, the balance, if there is a balance in humanity and in nature, it is because God through Jesus Christ sustains 
holds on to everything and he suffers long until the end of the age comes. So everything begins with our Lord Jesus Christ when he speaks about the latter days. From verse 7 to verse 11, there are the signs, the times and seasons that are described by the Word of God as the beginning of birth pangs. It is the last century, let's say, where the main characteristic is great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences, fearful sights and great signs from heaven, and especially two world wars. Of course, why does the Word of God explain us these things this way? Because he says, when you see all these things taking place, and I hope that we will examine these things with detail, the things that God prophesies about, and many things of these have happened, other things are happening, and other things will happen. When we see these things happening, then he says, lift up your heads, for your redemption is at hand. So the latter days begin in the last century, this is the last century, with, as we said, the main characteristics, which are hungers, uh, earthquakes, sicknesses, pestilences, fearful sights from heaven, deceits, this is the main characteristic, see that no one deceives you, and even more deceptions in the name of Christ, because many will come in my name, and they will say, it is I, and that the time is at hand. But when you see these things happening, do not be afraid. These things must take place. And when you even hear about wars and great discord, all these things must happen. But you must know that the time has not come yet. We still have time to go. And of course, it is the last generation that we're talking about where the Word of God describes by saying that when you see the fig tree blossoming, producing leaves and beginning to blossom, then you must know, then you know that the summer is now near. So also when you see these things happening, then this generation shall not pass away until all these things take place. So now everything will be take place quickly and as the Word of God says in the book of Revelation, and let us see it together my beloved brethren, the book of Revelation everything that you see, he said to John, and anything that I told you, they shall take place very quickly, in a very short time, very fast they will take place. But, before we go on into the period which already has been uh, explained, that is the birth pangs, already we've seen two world wars, as it was in 1914 the first, and 1940 the second, and the earthquakes is something that when I was a child, I didn't even take it into account, and none of us uh, did take these earthquakes into account, but now we all tremble throughout all the Brits and wets of earth. Pestilence is, is a terrible thing, sicknesses. It's something that exists in humanity now times, and I've told you I'm not referring to other sicknesses except the ones, this last one, let's say, which is a terrifying thing for humanity, which is the, the bird flu, as they describe because if this virus is mutated, then the disaster, and it, I mean it goes into the mammals, then the disaster will be great. And we're not talking about a financial disaster then, we're talking about Middle Ages. Everything will stop. All the industries will end, uh, meat, uh, yogurt, everything will come to an end. Fish, everything will, be this, uh, will stop. There will be no consume, consumer nor consumerism. This is the fear of the Western world, because the other world, besides the civilized world that is called the United States, Europe, Australia, beside these civilized worlds that know, the others cannot understand a lot of things, because they have so many problems to face that they do not give great importance to this. And that is why you see that in the East, in Vietnam and elsewhere, we see many cases of this flu even hitting human beings. But scientists are not interested in human beings. They don't care about human beings. Even if a few people die, it doesn't matter. Even if a thousand people die, it doesn't matter. Even if myriads die, so what? What the scientists are worried about 
is lest this flu enter the mammals and then it won't be controllable. And so I can explain this. The other si diseases of uh, the mammals, which is like uh, fever and this latest one, which was the mad cow's disease and all the other diseases, they just put that region or that city, that nation in quarantine and that's it. The rest cannot get sick. But if the bird flu is transferred into the mammals, you cannot contain the birds. You cannot stop the birds from flying. So wherever they pass, forgive me, wherever they do their droppings, wherever they sit down, there will be contamination up in the mountains, up in the valleys, in the cities, in the, in the countryside. No one will be able to control it then. And this is called an epidemic. And when we mean epidemic, when we say epidemic, of course there is the, the meaning of disease, but the financialists transfer epidemic to the term, I'll tell you this term, but I don't remember it now. They mean a global fall in the economy that will come from people not consuming meat. They will have an abundance of supply of meat, and no one will be buying it, and they will be throwing it away an abundance of a supply of milk, an abundance of supply of uh, yogurt, all, every, every type of food. And the food industry that now supports the global industry will come to an end. So these things are already taking place. But of course, as the Word of God describes to us and quiets us down, is that all these things will be a sign, but they will not be God's judgment. God's judgment will come after the rapture of the church. Until the rapture of the church, we are the church, and we hope that we are also a part of the church of Christ by the grace of God as people individually. We are the church that is the salt of the earth, which means it preserves the earth and makes it tasty. And we are also the light of the world, which means it enlightens. As we said before, the Apostle Paul said, I am the least, and God has counted me worthy to give light to all and show them what the mystery of Christ that has been hidden in God from the, from the beginning of time. And that was that secret plan that God had from the beginning, right from the beginning, right from the beginning. We're talking about billions of years, I don't know how many time, years, the infinite years, who can calculate this, from the moment that, it, so he says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, his plan which we are living now was recorded because we mustn't forget that in God there, there is and there never was a present, past and future. He isn't, doesn't have a human mind, but in God all things are a heavenly presence, an eternal presence. Everything is open and naked to Him. He knows everything. There is nothing that He does not know. There is nothing that He has not permitted, and there is nothing that He has not done. So this God explains to us now what will follow. But He says before, Christ says, before all these things happen, that is before the last age begins in the latter days, you, our Lord says, you will have a problem. And from verse 12 to verse 19, Christ our Lord describes the first apostolic church and by reading it we see that all these things did take place. He says, but before all these things they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. They will bring you before kings and rulers so they can question you, but be careful. All these things I will permit, God will permit, and this is the great grandeur of God. Anything that will happen in your life, prism, imprisonment, persecution, they will give you up into the synagogues, they will bring you before kings and rulers, all these bad things that you will suffer, I will take advantage of them so that they may become my testimony. Through these things the gospel of Jesus Christ will be preached. Through these trials of the first apostolic church, Christianity was supported and withstood and overcame all of humanity, the church of Christ.
which was one back then. The great difference of the first apostolic church with the last apostolic church today is in the number. Back then it was one church and that was it throughout the whole world. Now, now God has permitted for there to be 60 queens, 80 concubines and innumerable young women. And among these innumerable young ones, we are also there. But the Word of God continues and says, I have one dove though, my spotless one. The one that has come from her mother, the first apostolic church, and is like her mother, the first apostolic church, which is glorious, will be glorious, holy and blessed, because that is how I will receive her up. So the first apostolic church had a mission for Christianity to be strengthened, for the gospel to be preached and proclaimed, before the rage of the devil who was trying in every way to quench the preaching of the gospel. Of course he did not succeed, but there were sacrifices on Christ's part. Of course, he says also, many of the Christians will be offended then, so that they will betray one another and even hate one another. The persecution will be so great so that whoever doesn't have deep roots will be offended by it. And what is the result of the offense? That I hate, I dislike, I depart and in the end I hate my fellow man. And not only do I hate him but I also betray him as Judas did. They will betray one another, many. And all these things did take place in the first apostolic church. But in the Gospel of Luke, he also talks about another disaster. From 20 to 24, he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem and of the Temple of Solomon, as was described by our Lord in the beginning to the disciples who were admiring the stones and the donations of the Temple. He told them that nothing will be left standing. And he begins with signs. And we thank God, my beloved brethren, for the Word of God, because it's not vague, neither is it hypothetical. But the Word of God is very specific. I like to say also that the Word of God is mathematics. One and one equals two. Because God does not want to trick us, He doesn't want to be deceived. God doesn't want to permit the devil to deceive us and for us to be deceived. Neither does he want our heart to deceive us, nor the devil to deceive, deceive us. But he wants with specific steps us to observe, to walk, and to glorify God for his word that is perfect, that is contemporary, that is in, without law and without flaw, it has no speck, no, no error, it has no contradictions, even though it has been written by so many different authors but it has been inspired by one, that is the paraclete, the spirit of truth. So when you see Jerusalem being surrounded, that is being surrounded by a camp, then you must know, you must be, be, be sure, neither believe, neither think, then you must know that its desolation is near. Its desolation is at hand. Jerusalem will be destroyed. And even more, it is said in the in history books, in tradition, mostly in history, because there were some CDs that spoke about the Roman Empire and the destruction of Jerusalem, that there were two attacks on Jerusalem. One was by the father of Titus, who surrounded Jerusalem, but he received the order to give up. And whoever was surrounded in Jerusalem, and that were Christian, I mean, they believed that the time of its desolation had come. God gave him the chance to do his will and be saved. Then when the attackers left, the unbelievers said, they mocked the Christians and they said, see, they left, they didn't attack us. But the Christians who knew the signs of the times, they abandoned Jerusalem and they were saved. Then Titus, the son, Titus, the son of the previous one, I don't remember his name, came 
and he laid siege on Jerusalem and he destroyed Jerusalem in a terrible manner in reality he did not leave a stone upon a stone in Jerusalem you cannot find ancient ruins except some walls one wall he destroyed a whole city completely destroyed it he killed he murdered and because the Jews were very uh, covetous of money they swallowed it says their belongings so that when they left, they may have him, gold I mean, and anything that they could swallow. And he would tear their stomachs, slay their stomachs open so he can take their gold. He slaughtered pregnant women. It was a terrible persecution and disaster. And so they were scattered since then throughout all the widths and breadths of the earth. And the word, the name Hebrew, has gone throughout all the world. Hebrews. We all know about the Jews. Even from a young child, we knew the Jews, how bad they were. And of course, this tribe, this nation, throughout these 2,000 years, has suffered terrible persecution. Terrible persecution. But, because the Holy Seed was within them, they survived. And it is amazing how they survived. Other people have just dissolved and they're just ex historical names but the Jews for 2,000 years have been in dispersed and they're still alive and the main characteristic of their survival was the Word of God the Old Testament it was God's help because God hasn't ended his plan with the people of Israel but through their afflictions and the persecutions that they themselves sought in the beginning because when Christ was being crucified or when he was going to be crucified they said they were not afraid to say this even though they knew as many scribes and Pharisees knew that if God wasn't with Jesus he wouldn't be able to do these miracles the things that Christ, that Christ did if God wasn't with him and even more, no one could speak with grace, with authority and power like Christ did. And they did not hesitate to call out, crucify him, crucify him. And they were not afraid of God. And they said, may his blood be upon us and on our children. And we must be careful of what we say, my brethren. We must be careful of what we hear. We must be careful how we hear. But especially we must be careful what we say. Be careful of your words. But what God gives great importance to is be careful what you think. We, we must be careful. We must be careful. Once I said something and I heard the voice of God telling me, be careful, I can hear you. And uh, my knees were trembling. But you tell me, was I, am I corrected now? I haven't corrected myself yet, but I'm trying. We have to be careful of what we say. Because from our words we will be judged by our words and no bad word will be left without punishment and judgment and let us never forget that there in the judgment seat of Christ every one of us will be rewarded according to anything good or bad he did David does isn't wrong when he says by the Holy Spirit Lord please guard my mouth Lord, put a guardian over my mouth so I can be careful of my words. There's a beautiful psalm where David decided and said, I will not speak upon again in sin with my tongue. But a short time later he said, I burst out, I couldn't, keep, I couldn't refrain my tongue. And then I said, Lord, please, you put a guard on my mouth. And he says, now that you have protected it, it is guarded. Glory be to your name. This is who we are, my brethren. This is who man is. He is of like suffering. Let us never forget in our prayer and amongst all the other petitions to say, Lord, keep our mouth. Because you know, my beloved brethren, whatever we say hurts people. And if we repent, the bleeding stops. But the wound is still there. The marks are there. And as there are the, the marks on the hands of Christ, they remain so also our words remain we must never forget that nothing is hidden 
whatever you say in the secret place, Christ will bring it out of the open. Neither in your heart should you keep something. I have been amazed by the things that God does in my life. And all of us, I imagine, but now I'm referring to myself, as I believe that you could also refer to yourself. The experience that you have, how God reveals everything and everything is open before you. May God keep us. But He doesn't only reveal your things, He reveals my things as well. And He doesn't only reveal your things and my things, He reveals the other man's as well. And not only does He reveal it to us, He reveals it to everyone. But the main characteristic, my brethren, isn't what we know or not know, we people. What matters is what Christ knows about us. Lord, please set a guardian angel over our mouth so he can keep our heart, clean our heart. And the best prayer, the most beautiful prayer that I've seen in the Bible is, Lord, make me return and I shall return for I will not return otherwise if you don't do it. If you don't return me, Lord, I cannot return on my own. If you do not help me, Lord, I cannot stand on my own. If you do not give me a spirit of repentance, of compassion, of grace, I cannot be found in the way that you want me. Because it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. And everything is by grace, my brethren, on the person who has prepared his heart to seek the grace of God. He continues and he says things which, I have to point this out, not only took place, but the things that take place now are a lot more than the things that are written, that Christ has written, the Word of God says. He says, now forgive me, verse 22, he says, 21, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of her depart. This is the commandment of the Lord. And let not those who are in the country enter her. So that is, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, and you are there in Judea, run to the mountains. If you are in it, get out of it. And if you are in the fields, in the countryside, don't go into it. Why? Because the time of vengeance has come. These are times of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. The time of vengeance has come. And may God keep us, because there is in the life of every man a time of vengeance. A time of vengeance. There is a time of grace. There is a time of long-suffering. But at some point, God and God's long-suffering comes to an end there is also a time of vengeance and God will appear as an avenger over the people who have not known him and they did not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ so how serious is it first of all for us to give grace and always give glory to God for we have known God through Jesus Christ but also how important is it for us to be careful lest God become an avenger upon us come with vengeance toward us if and when we do not submit to the gospel of Christ and especially when we not repent from that. This is woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nourishing babies in those days for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. This is a thing that has been fulfilled, that has taken place. It was a lot worse than anyone can read and comprehend, and a, mo a lot crueler than anyone can imagine. And even more, another great sign is that Jerusalem, that back then was trampled by the Romans, when the Romans will leave, again it will be trampled. It will always be trampled under the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, which is none other, the times of the Gentiles that are being fulfilled now, that is the end of the grace for the Gentiles, which comes with the rapture of the church. And I wonder, my brethren, how believers, theologians, religious people cannot comprehend through the scriptures, how these people cannot understand the meaning and the mystery of the rapture. 
But in reality, we must not wonder. Because the Word of God cannot be studied, it cannot be educated, it it's, cannot be discovered, it's revealed. So instead of me wondering, instead of me wondering, it's better for me to praise God and thank Him because God has revealed to us the things which an eye has not seen, an ear has not heard, the hearts of men have not risen on, but God has revealed these things to those who love Him. And as He reveals these things to those who loves him who love him he reveals to us also that anything that happens will be for the good of those who love God so we truly are in the grace of God and we are blessed for this we stand in the presence of God let us hold on to the Word of God in our hands and it is so easy for us to understand what the Word of God says that Jerusalem shall be trampled by the nations the Gentiles it still is you can find every nation having a part of Jerusalem. There are Americans, English people, Russians, Assyrians, Israelis, Philistines, Palestinians, forgive me, Palestinians, Greeks, even Greeks are there, Orthodox Greeks, Catholics. All nations are there in Jerusalem. They are under all nations. It will be trampled under the Gentiles until the rapture of the church. When the rapture of the church takes place, Jerusalem will be trampled under the Gentiles. And as it says in Zechariah, the word of God, not only will it be trampled, but he also says two nice things that I want us to read, my brethren, concerning Jerusalem. It will be a cu cup of drunkenness for all the nations around. A cup of drunkenness. They'll be drinking from it and getting dizzy. When they take from Jerusalem, they'll get drunk with it. And truly, all the nations that are around it, they drink from Jerusalem and they get drunk. They all want it. But they are all dizzy because they're afraid of one another because of the evil that is coming. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. For all peoples. No one wants her now. No one wants to deal with her now. Recently now, I'm not talking about an old time ago, but recently Booth said, I'll come to Jerusalem to bring peace. He never went. He couldn't go. Who? The world leader who anything he says goes. He Anything that he says goes, but as long as it's written. A heavy rock, a heavy stone, and all who would heave it away, whoever takes the responsibility to take Jerusalem on their shoulders to solve the problem will be cut in pieces. Even if all the nations try and they take Jerusalem on their shoulders to set her free, to help her, to do anything, they'll be destroyed. And whoever has, has gotten his hands on Jerusalem has been destroyed. has been cut in pieces because that is what the Word of God says. They will be cut in pieces and all the nations of the earth in the end will gather against her. This hasn't happened. Everything else has happened. And all the nations in the end shall, of the earth shall be gathered against it. Unbelievable. Against Jerusalem. And what is Jerusalem? It's a small village. Now it's a city. Okay. But once, before 1948, it was just a village. All the nations of the earth shall be gathered against this city. This is the Word of God. And He is yes and amen. And we thank the Lord as we said, because we live these things, we see these things, and we glorify God. Christ has given grace to our life. May we also understand it. We understand these things and we're sure that we understand them because the things that we understand take place. As before 1948, our brethren the Christians from 1900s and on, when the fire of the Pentecost was lit first in Caucasus, in Russia, in northern Russia, and then in the United States, when the fire of the Pentecost took fire, started, the Holy Spirit said and preached that Jerusalem will be set free, that the people of Israel would return, and everyone mocked them, no one believed them, especially after Hitler's Holocaust, where the blood of Jesus that the uh, Israelis said, uh, they said, 
may be upon us, and it fell upon them in, 19, in the 70 AD, and then in 1940 it fell upon their children. And the word of God that is without a lie was confirmed once again when in 1948 the victorious powers, the victorious powers of the Second World War gave the commandment that the people of Israel return to their land. By serving and fulfilling the counsel of God without even knowing it probably. We thank God. But we have to know, finishing up here, that God's counsels are in our life. And it is good for us also to fulfill them with acknowledgement, with knowledge. Because God has a plan, and I will say this because God has told me to say this. He has a plan that is marvelous for every one of us. He has a plan that is glorious. And it is good for us to seek this plan so it may be fulfilled and Christ may be glorified in our lives so that when we return to the kingdom of heaven we may enjoy our reward in full. May the Lord bless us and next Thursday we will continue by the grace of Christ. Now let us sing a hymn. Amen. <laughs>